Hi, my name is Stan. My name is Connie. My name is Judy. My name is Elin, and I'm a caregiver to my mother. And I care for my mother, Octavia. And I'm a caregiver for my mother. And I'm a caregiver to my husband, Art. I'm a caregiver for my wife, Anne, who's 72 years old. Basically, I've done everything for providing for both of them. I take care of my mother on the weekends. I take her grocery shopping. Not only household chores. I provide her medical care, coordination, driving, errands. Choosing meals, making meals, cleaning up. Uh, I find that uh, I take care of anything that he can't take care of. Sometimes I find balancing time a real challenge. Uh, the difficult part for me is taking me into consideration. Balancing her needs with the needs of my family, the needs of my marriage, and my own needs. Staying calm, nice, and positive. The real challenge is, of course, the distance and the moment you get that last phone call. What I love most about taking care of her is knowing that we're providing a secure and comfortable home for her. It's the time we spend together is the adventure of finding out new things all the time to try to help him stay out of pain. My name is Ed. I'm a spouse and I'm a caregiver. My name is Colette. I'm a daughter and a caregiver. I'm a caregiver and I'm a daughter. And I'm a wife and a caregiver. I'm a daughter and a caregiver. I'm a son, a nephew, and a caregiver. Hi, my name is Deborah Day, and I help manage United Way Caregivers Coalition. While caring for a loved one has its special rewards, it's a very challenging job. It can be stressful, overwhelming, and sometimes lonely. Each caregiving situation is unique, but all caregivers share the need for information and support. And that's where the Caregivers Coalition comes in. We help caregivers receive the support they need to take care of their loved ones and to take care of themselves. Caregivers who lead healthy, productive lives will be better caregivers. The most important thing to remember is that as a caregiver, you're not alone. Catherine Alexa. Uh, is the, I have to read this because I never get it straight, is the Provider Relations Coordinator at the Hospice of New Jersey. I met her a number of years ago and was impressed immediately. Um, she, at that time, she was the uh, administrator at a, an assisted living. And I walked into this room and saw this very young woman and thought, what does she know? She, <laughs> one of the smartest, most gracious women I've met in a long time and I gladly and, and happily introduce you to Catherine Alexa. Thank you, Ruth. So, good evening, and I just want to take a moment to thank Deb Day for inviting me this evening, and to Ruth rothbart Mayer for recommending me uh, for this evening. Uh, I know this is your night out, so uh, it was, I'm sure, a difficult decision for the committee to invite a speaker with a topic on hospice. It is not the most upbeat topic I can think of, but it's a very important topic to discuss. Uh, as Ruth said, my background is in senior care on the nursing home and assisted living side. I did that for about eight years before I came over to hospice. One of the reasons that I came to hospice was because I saw as a director in the facilities what a difference it made, not only for the patients, but for the families. Uh, it truly, truly is a service that gets people through one of the most difficult times in their lives. When I worked on the nursing home side, I used to say, putting your loved one in a nursing center is the most, one of the most difficult times in your life without realizing that's the second most difficult time. The most difficult time is when you're confronted with a life-limiting illness, whether it be Alzheimer's dementia, cancer, renal disease, whatever it is, that is 
the most difficult time in your life. And that's where we come in. And that's the gift that we give is to bring that circle of support around the family and the patient during that difficult time. So again, thank you for having me. I'd like to open with a question. How many people here in the audience have had personal experience with a loved one and hospice care? If I could have a show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of you, wow. So just by a nod of the head, would you say that hospice care helped your family through what would otherwise be an almost impossible time? Yeah, okay. Thank you, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Tonight we're going to be talking about myths and misconceptions around hospice. Uh, it's definitely one of those things that has a stigma of sorts to it. And I always use this example um, of going to a senior fair at a uh, you know, local senior center. And you would think you would go there and have lots of interactions, but one of the things we've seen in hospice is that we put our tablecloth up just like this beautiful United Way tablecloth and it says Hospice of New Jersey. And you should see how people circle as far from the table as possible to get away from us as if hospice is something you can catch, right? Um, so we're here tonight to sort of debunk whatever those myths surrounding the care is. Um, it's been referred to as the H word. It's a little bit scary. Um, so here we go. What is hospice? So hospice is a philosophy of care. The hospice philosophy accepts death as the final stage of life. And I, I would like to just point that out right in the beginning. What we do in hospice care is not about the person's death itself. It's about whatever portion of their life is left and making that filled with comfort and the most quality experience that they can have. The goal is to help patients live their last days alert and aware and as pain-free as possible. We try to manage symptoms so that the person's last days may be spent with dignity and quality surrounded by their loved ones. So we treat the person rather than the disease. And that's something important to point out. Um, when folks sign up for services, we always have them go through something called the informed consent. Understanding that hospice care, unlike any other medical care, is a diverging road. Meaning, you're no longer seeing care uh, professionals for treatment of your underlying illness you're seeing them to treat symptoms. Okay, so you're not looking at, is the person's heart okay? Because we know that it's not in the case of a congestive heart failure patient. But what are we looking at? We're looking at, is their breathing labored? Because their lungs are filling up with fluid due to overload from the heart failure. What is going on from an anxiety standpoint? And what can we do to treat those symptoms? So I wanted to just point that uh, difference out. Who qualifies for the hospice Medicare benefit? So Medicare Part A, which I'm sure all of you are somewhat familiar with, uh, we have all the alphabet soup of Medicare, but hospice is under the Part A benefit. It's for patients who elect a non-aggressive treatment and who have a life-limiting prognosis. There are four types of hospice care, or levels as we call them. The first one is routine. Routine hospice care is what you would normally think of when someone has hospice at home. By a show of hands, how many of you care for a loved one in a home, in a private home? Okay, so large majority of you. So if a uh, patient is given a uh, prognosis of six months about, the hospice care can be brought into the home under this routine level. That usually means that the nurse's aide visits five days a week, the nurse visits once a week, and then we have additional team members, as we'll discover in a moment, that supplement that care. Now, how many of you as caregivers have heard the term respite? Yes, it's a big one. It's a, it's a much needed word, and especially in that last chapter when things are so stressful and you are feeling the pressure 
of caring for that loved one 24 hours a day. The Medicare benefit allows for if you really need a break, the loved one can be placed in a, a, a facility just like Daughters of Israel for about five days uh, at no charge to the family or the patient. The third level of hospice is called continuous care. So this type of care can be done as well in the home. It can also be done in an assisted living. And it basically requires the person to have some symptoms that are unmanaged. So symptoms that can be unmanaged include pain, anxiety, nausea, vomiting, all kinds of things that aren't pleasant to talk about while you're eating dinner necessarily. Uh, but that just means that we're bringing in even more care into the home. So the minimum amount of care that you would get under a continuous care benefit is eight hours, 50% of which are provided by an RN, and the other 50% provided by a hospice aide. So moving on to the last level is inpatient care, and as the word implies, it can be done in a skilled nursing facility such as this one or in an inpatient hospice unit. Now, um, one of the misconceptions we're gonna get into is that hospice is a place, and there certainly are hospice units. For example, we have ours in St. Joseph in Wayne, uh, but it's not something where you can just go there and live out your final six months. A lot of people sort of think that's what it is, and certainly that unit is only for either respite care or the inpatient hospice care, meaning that there must be an uncontrolled symptom. Okay? The interdisciplinary team is listed here. So just like in nursing facilities, we have an administrator in hospice that sort of heads up our organization. Each branch has a physician associated with it as a medical director a nurse manager called a patient care coordinator. Then under them are the team of hospice nurses or case managers to whom the hospice aides report. Then in support of the patient and family, we have social workers. At times we may call in a respiratory therapist, spiritual and bereavement counselors, other types of therapists. But I wanna just take a pause a moment on that point. Um, it's not often that the respiratory or physical therapy is done while on hospice service. The only time it's usually brought in is when there's a possibility of increasing comfort or ease of transfer. So if a person requires a two-person transfer and the caregiver is the only person in the home and the person is able to get to a one-person transfer, we may bring in uh, therapy for that purpose, but it wouldn't be the same type of ongoing therapy that you would receive with uh, the visiting nurse or in a facility. We also have an army of volunteers, and interestingly enough, um, most of our volunteers are comprised of former caregivers who had a family member on hospice, and they felt so uh, touched by their experience with hospice staff that they want to give back and spend time with uh, hospice patients visiting or reading to them, playing cards, whatever it is. Professional management is included with the hospice benefit. So that basically means that if a person doesn't have a community physician, they can elect to use our hospice physician as their primary. Now that's not to say that the hospice physician will come out to the home and see the patient often. They will go for something called a face-to-face -face encounter, or if it's absolutely necessary, they will go, but largely the care under the hospice team is driven by the nurse who reports to the doctor, and then that's how it uh, works. Pharmaceutical services for routine and emergency situations. This is something that we at hospice sometimes take for granted, but it's such a huge relief uh, for the families because one of the uh, most difficult ongoing challenges is getting all those medications refilled, making sure they're picked up at the pharmacy or delivered, and we have our own pharmacy that will deliver those medications to the home. Right now, hospice uh, Medicare benefit covers any drug related to the primary diagnosis. So 
let's just say you come on to hospice for heart failure. All your diuretics would be covered, your blood pressure medications would be covered, pain medications, anxiety medications, uh, and it, there's actually a rule being uh, discussed where hospice may end up covering all medications for the patient. 24-hour availability. This is one of my favorite uh, benefits about hospice. One of the biggest issues that hospitals are having right now is something called readmissions, especially when we're talking about chronic illnesses such as heart failure, uh, COPD, which is the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, there are, I believe, six different diagnoses this year that are on the list for hospitals to watch for the person to be readmitted within 30 days, and those two are on that list. One of the biggest reasons why people are readmitted to hospitals within the 30 days are because A, they get their medications mixed up, or B, the only phone a friend number, emergency number that they have is 911. Something goes wrong in the home, what do you do? I mean, that's the only thing you can do is call 911 and that's how the person gets back to the hospital. If the person chooses not to have aggressive treatment and meets the criteria for hospice, you get a lifeline. Our number is 24-7, and even if it's 2 o'clock in the morning, if the person can't be brought under control with over-the-phone instruction, we will send an RN out to the house, and that is one of the biggest benefits to our care. So the continuity of care, and then the interdisciplinary team, or IDT, which consists of all those folks we just talked about, reviews clients' medical record, to ensure con uh, conformance and appropriateness of the plan of care. So the final rule, this slide may not make a lot of sense to those of you who are not very familiar with the healthcare industry, but uh, CMS is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, and it requires that a hospice physician or nurse practitioner have these face-to-face -face encounters if the person is on hospice for longer than 180 days. Uh, if you aren't great at math, that is six months. Uh, and this better enables hospices to comply with the eligibility criteria and to identify and discharge patients who don't meet that criteria. Uh, and we're gonna get into this in a moment, but the goal of hospice care and the eligibility for it are going back to that six month prognosis. So if you put someone on who really isn't within that window, they could obviously have the um, a bit propensity to stay on service for years, and I think Medicare wants to watch that as far as from a financial standpoint. So getting into the myths and misconceptions, we're going to go over 12. The first myth is that a patient is financially liable for hospice services. Not true. Medicare covers hospice at 100% with no copays and no deductibles. If a person does not have Medicare and they have Medicaid, the benefit remains the exact same. And most hospice agencies contract with managed care organizations. I know that many people have managed Medicare at this point um, or private insurance and many times they have hospice benefits as well. I can't speak for every organization, but I know ours does a large amount of charity uh, care for hospice patients as well. Second myth is that death is hastened in hospice. Uh, I know that there, that's a bit of an older misconception, but I've had family members say to me, so are you gonna stop feeding my mother? And I will look at them and say, of course, of course we're not gonna stop feeding your mother. And are you gonna take my mother off of all of her medications and just give her morphine and of course we're not going to do that and you know maybe there was a time 20 years ago where things like that were done but it's certainly not the case now and the primary goal of, of hospice is comfort and so um, of course we're not going to encourage a lot of feeding if the person has a lot of difficulty swallowing and they're you know aspirating on their food but we will look at maintaining the medications that um, contribute to their comfort. 
So according to a 2007 finding from the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, people live an average of 29 days longer receiving hospice care than without. Does that surprise anyone? I know it sort of surprised me in the, in the beginning. So going back to the heart failure, uh, patients actually live 81 days longer. Lung cancers, 39 days, and pancreatic cancers, 21 days. And a lot of times people ask me, well, why is that the case? And I think there's a few reasons, although I think it could be debatable. But one is that the person's anxiety is reduced greatly by having a plan understanding that they're not going to keep doing experimental treatments, they're not going to proceed with more chemotherapy, more radiation, more hospitalizations. Having that plan gives the person a lot of sense of security, understanding how their last days will be spent, and obviously it reduces hospitalizations and infections. Okay, myth number three, cancer is the only diagnosis that qualifies for the hospice benefit. And certainly I think in those early days, cancer was the largest portion of hospice care. But now only 35% of all hospice patients have cancer and the other 65% are diagnoses that are listed below. Now one difference here um, is that that third diagnosis, failure to thrive in a very recent rule change was actually taken away from us. So we're going to have to get this slide updated, but there's usually a way to find the diagnosis that they qualify for if the person truly is failing to thrive. That's oftentimes a secondary uh, diagnosis to something that's really going on underneath that. We just have to do a little bit more to detect. Okay, another myth, choosing comfort care stops all means of patient support. So a patient can be a full code on hospice. Now, for those of you who aren't in the medical field, a full code means that you don't have a do not resuscitate order in place. So although oftentimes we recommend that you have one, when you come onto our service, it's not necessary to be uh, brought onto the service. Uh, but a lot of times it's our job to just educate the families and the patients on why that might be the right choice for them at a certain point during their care. Another myth is that a physician has to initiate the hospice referral. And that's certainly not the case. Although we cannot come in and start providing the service without the physician's agreement and order, the physician doesn't have to come up with the idea. And to be honest, most of the time we get referrals from either social workers, family members, case managers, rarely does the physician take the time to make the referral initially, um, although they do need to have that initial conversation with the patient about the prognosis and the disease state. In hospice, the concept of comfort equals morphine. That's a big myth. Although we do use morphine when it's needed, and honestly, it's one of the most effective drugs for pain and anxiety management that there is, it's certainly not the only thing that we do. There are many other pain medications that can be used, and the concept of comfort is much more than pain relief. Uh, comfort care can include oxygen, hydration and nutrition in certain cases, skin integrity maintenance, which is usually assisted by our hospice aides, oral care, music and or pet therapy, bathing assistance, spiritual counseling, and companionship all contribute to the overall comfort of the patient. Another myth is that a patient is eligible for hospice only if they have six months or less to live. So having six months or less to live is different than having a prognosis of six months. Now you might say that doesn't make any sense, but the fact is nobody has a crystal ball, even your physician, and they only know where you are approximately in the disease process. That means that you could have six months, you could have eight months, you could have 10 months, and everyone responds differently to the care that we provide, and about 
one in five of the patients that we bring onto hospice end up coming off at some point because they're either improved or they're stable or um, there's just not a need for the services anymore. So that's certainly um, the six month criteria is not the end all be all. One of the biggest problems that we have in hospice is this stigma of having six months or less because people wait too long. And uh, I can't remember the exact percentage of patients, but a very large percentage, and it's growing every year, of patients who come onto service are only on for seven days or less. And when you're on for seven days or less, neither the patient or the family receives the full benefit of what we do, of the support that we give, and although they're still entitled to the bereavement care that we offer after the person passes away, that preparation in advance of the passing hasn't really been uh, done properly. Another myth is that we only treat the patient. I always say that 50% of our job in hospice is to treat and support our families. The families are going through every bit as much pain and grieving and loss even before the person passes, just understanding what the diagnosis is and understanding what is going to happen in their lives and that their lives are about to drastically change. Um, many times I, when I initially meet with caregivers who generally sign the, the paperwork for hospice, they tell me things like, I've been a caregiver for 25 years. I've been a caregiver for 15 years for my parents. First my mother, then my father part of that person's identity, and I'm sure some of you in this room feel this way, is wrapped up in being a caregiver. And when that loss is coming up, and you know it is, that means part of your identity is going to be changing drastically as well. So we understand that in, at hospice and our social work and spiritual care support really makes an effort to do one-on-one -on -one sessions and helping that caregiver through that process of transition. Another myth, once on hospice, a patient cannot see their primary care physician. So they absolutely can. Now, there have been cases that I've seen where a primary physician in the community wants to hand off the care to the hospice physician, but it really doesn't happen often. And many times, the primary will continue to sign the orders will continue to take the phone calls for your loved one. And I've also known some doctors to do house calls even nowadays. Uh, I think that's probably getting more popular again as people are managed better in the home. Spoke on this briefly, hospice is not a destination. It's not a place, at least it's not anymore, although it maybe used to be. It's a service. 90% of hospice service, I guess that's across the board, occurs in a patient's home. 77% of those patients pass away at their home. Hospice service can be provided wherever the patient calls home, whether that's their home, assisted living, nursing home. Uh, and you know, one thing that surprised me when I came on board was understanding that even if a person lived in a shelter, we could provide services in the shelter. Once the patient elects hospice service, it's permanent. And that's a big fear that a lot of people have. In fact, I spoke to a daughter today who said to me, you know, I just want to think carefully before I start service for my father because I don't want to start it too soon. Now her father is in stage four congestive heart failure, which is the final stage. And there's no doubt that he meets the criteria for hospice eligibility, but she has this fear that um, somehow putting him on the service is going to have him give up and that it'll be this permanent decision that you can't take back and that's just certainly not the case. You know, hospice like any medical care, any medical treatment can be revoked, changed, modified at any time per the patient wishes or the family wishes. Another one is this myth about uh, for-profit hospice being uh, much different than nonprofit, and just like in the nursing facility world, um, there is 
the company is more about the people who work there and the philosophy behind it. So I certainly would never tell you that going with a nonprofit is better than a for-profit. You just want to speak to your doctor, your friends, um, and people you trust about maybe uh, hospices that they've used and get a good advice that way. But it, you know, the tax status is not always the best way to decide. Um, so I'm going to leave it there, and I will open it up for questions. So the question is, will a nurse practitioner take over management when, of the patient when brought on to hospice? So, so the answer to that question is no, and also it depends. <laughs> so it depends on the a physician that you have if they're willing to follow your loved one uh, and also sometimes when a family member is in a facility uh, they're seen more often by a nurse practitioner but it's certainly there's no hard and fast rule and each case would vary. Would a hospice nurse also be able to take that role and the answer is no the hospice nurse cannot be in place of the physician the hospice nurse works under the physician and, and as part of that team, that's correct. And the question is, uh, can hospice agencies work outside of the state where their primary location is? And uh, it's, it's a very good question. The answer is, it is a licensure from each state. Uh, our hospice company, just for an example, the parent is called American Hospice. We are Hospice of New Jersey, but we do have hospices in eight other states and operate them under licenses. The license is from the state of New Jersey and then your oversight is from the Department of Health, just like the nursing facilities. The question is how many hours a day of a nurse's aid does hospice provide? Uh, the answer to that is it depends. It uh, depends on the agency and it depends on the patient. So Medicare's guideline is that you must provide care in accordance with the patient's plan of care. Well, that's pretty big, right? Um, so some states, I know down south, uh, it's often uh, noted that you would only get an aid three days a week or two days a week. Here in New Jersey, we ha the standard is higher. Our agency, for example, the standard is five days a week of an hour and a half to two hours. But you may find that that varies uh, between agencies. So the question is, if a person goes into a hospice facility, is the life expectancy six months or yes, or less? <laughs> and the answer is yes. <laughs> um, if a person comes into a hospice facility, going back again to those levels of care, the four levels of care, the facility is only for inpatient hospice. So that means not only does the person have six months of a prognosis, but they also have uncontrolled or unmanaged symptoms such as pain or nausea, other ones that we discussed. And the downside to that is once those symptoms are under control, which is of course the goal of hospice service, and if we do our job correctly, those symptoms should be brought under control fairly quickly, within a week or so, then the person isn't able to stay in the hospice facility under the Medicare benefit. So we have a full-time social worker in our unit who works with families on discharge planning. And you know, I think that could have been a myth on this list is that if you go to a hospice uh, center that you will pass away there and that's certainly not the case and we've discharged many people whose symptoms are brought under control whether it be back to their homes or to nursing centers etc okay so great question and that's what's the role of the hospice aid if they're only there between an hour and a half to two hours the role of the hospice aid is to supplement the care that the person already has in the home. So if the person requires 24 hour a day care, they must either live with a family member that provides that care, or some people have the ability to hire a private duty. And sometimes when there's a live-in private duty, one of the purposes of our AIDS visit is to relieve that person uh, so that they can have uh, somewhat of a break. 
Now, as far as answering your question about the medications, whoever the primary caregiver is in the home is responsible for giving the medications. If there's no one that has the ability to do that uh, and follow a medication regimen, then you might be right that it might be better to place the person in assisted living or nursing facility. Uh, you know, just to add on to that too, um, we provide uh, in New Jersey specifically um, something called a comfort kit. Uh, that is a box of medications that's given to the family uh, on admission to the service. And it's almost like a just in case emergency kit. So when you're using that lifeline at two o'clock in the morning because your loved one is short of breath, we may over the phone advise you to go into that comfort kit, look for a specific medication, and advise you on how to administer that. So being able to administer medicine is a very, very important uh, piece of the puzzle to keep the person safe at home. Well, the question is, uh, is someone able to have hospice care without the prognosis of six months? Um, and the answer is, not really. Um, so if, if there's a hospice agency, as you suggested, that's providing hospice care to people without a prognosis that would qualify them for hospice, it certainly could be considered fraud under Medicare's rules. Um, it's possible that you are referring to an agency that has both private duty care and hospice care. Uh, so for example, the VNA of Northern New Jersey has both. They have a hospice care section and a private duty section. And the difference is Medicare pays for hospice and uh, the family or patient pays for private duty. So um, in my experience in assisted living, uh, hospice can be brought in for dementia and Alzheimer's patients who are in the, the last stage of you know, severe dementia and Alzheimer's. And there are a few criteria that have to be met for hospice service to start. But to be frank with you, those are the patients who are most frequently discharged off of hospice. The reason being, someone with uh, severe dementia and Alzheimer's can present as if they are in that final chapter due to infection or other reasons and then rally for some other reason, whether it be the additional care that was brought in or medications that were given. Um, and then that person wouldn't meet those eligibility guidelines after they recover in a sense. So those folks shouldn't be kept on indefinitely. So the question is who's on the interdisciplinary team and how often do they review the medical records? And the answer, if you go back to the beginning of the presentation, there's a list. Um, on slide number four. Those are all the folks on the interdisciplinary team, which includes the uh, physician, the patient care coordinator, the nurse, the social worker, the spiritual care person, the volunteer coordinator, myself as provider relations. I don't know if I was included on that list, but I am on the team. Um, and the, those uh, team meetings, we call them, take place each week, and we review half the patients on our census each week. So the Medicare guideline requires that your medical record be reviewed by the IDT within f every 15 days. So by doing half each week, we get that guideline met. Good question. Uh, what are the differences between hospice and palliative care? Uh, the answer to that question is pretty simple. So palliative care, is, which is a euphemism for comfort care, is not always hospice, but hospice is always palliative care. So what do I mean? Some hospitals, actually most hospitals by now, 2014, have created a palliative care department. That usually consists of social workers, nurse practitioners, and uh, pain management physicians who do consultations while the person's in the hospital or perhaps while they're receiving outpatient treatment. And generally, uh, it's used for cancer patients. Now, there's no specific Medicare benefit for palliative care. So if you are receiving palliative care while you're getting aggressive treatment, for lack of a better word, such as chemo or radiation, 
um, you uh, cannot get this service I'm talking about, which is the nurse's aid, this, you know, our whole IDT, which is the hospice benefit. So both have the same goal of providing the patient with comfort, but one is done, palliative is done while they're receiving aggressive treatment, and hospice is done after the decision is made to discontinue aggressive treatment. Would a person who has extensive arthritis, um, or I guess you mean contractures, uh, mm -hmm. immobility, disability, so there used to be a, uh, a, a diagnosis called debility, and perhaps that could have been, but that was one of the diagnoses that was taken away from hospice care. And usually it's because it's very difficult to show that that person has a prognosis of six months. You know, there has to be a diagnosis that could uh, pretty clearly show that uh, in a clinical standpoint, you know, and certainly having immobility issues and um, extreme arthritis is debilitating in itself, but it may not be life limiting. So that's the tricky part. So the question was, the interdisciplinary team in the nursing home generally manages the nursing home patients, and at what point does the hospice interdisciplinary team step in and take over? And the answer is pretty simple. We actually don't take over. We are always considered to be supplemental, and in a nursing facility, you could almost consider us to be consultants. For example, our hospice nurse will not come in and take the job of the floor nurse in the nursing facility or administer the medications. Their job when it comes to nursing facility hospice is to consult on end of life symptoms. So the hospice nurse looks through a bit of a different lens when it comes to assessing the patient and assessing symptoms, and that's the expertise they bring in. They might make a recommendation to the doctor for medications or equipment, uh, and our social worker supplements the social worker in the nursing home by being able to spend a little bit more one-on-one -on -one time with the family, whether it be in ca for counseling purposes or end-of-life planning purposes. And I think any of you who've dealt with nursing facility uh, and, and facilities and social workers know how uh, really truly overworked they are and how much they have to do as far as Medicare guidelines and they just cannot have the type of time it would take to have that one-on-one -on -one sit-down session with patients and families like the hospice social worker. So we're brought in as additional team members during that last six months and the nursing home team continues their process. So the question is, when hospice is provided in the home, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on the family member or the caregiver to carry out the care itself, the physical care. And how do you deal with that? And you know, <laughs> there's no simple answer. It's not easy. Uh, again, we're brought in as support, but we don't take over. So sometimes uh, from a financial standpoint, the person can't afford to bring in the private duty caregiver, at which point uh, we may recommend looking at some alternative ways to get some relief, and our social workers are quite skilled in connecting you with uh, community services. Uh, but it's not easy, and it's never easy uh, as far as making a decision to keep your loved one in the home during those last six months, and you know, some Families, everyone has a different scenario, but some families, family members have promised never to put their loved one in a facility. Um, but sometimes the pressure is too high, and that decision being made sometimes is the right decision. I can't speak for everyone, but if the person's at the breaking point from a caregiving standpoint, it's best to do the right thing for yourself and for the patient. So the question is specific to Parkinson's diagnoses in patients uh, and whether or not their Parkinson's medication would be con continued under hospice care. Um, I want to go first to your point about uh, nursing facilities potentially using uh, 
discontinuing medication for convenience purposes. And I would certainly tell you that that should never be done and is absolutely against the state guidelines and any ethical guidelines that I'm aware of. Um, the quality of life of the patient should always be maximized. And the, you know, one of the things that I learned when I was uh, coming to my own in nursing facilities is that you always ask yourself what's the right thing for the patient and then you would know the answer and it's never what's the right thing for the staff members convenience um, so again you know putting that towards the hospice uh, side we would not look to con discontinue medication for convenience either if uh, if it contributed to the well-being and uh, comfort of the patient, we would absolutely continue it. And I think in Parkinson's, um, just doing activities of daily living, such as getting the person washed, getting the person dressed, changed, if you discontinued those movement medications, it would be much, much more difficult and painful for the person to just go through those daily activities. So I, it's, to my knowledge, we haven't recommended discontinuing it unless there was some other reason. A good question. The question is, when on hospice, can you receive IV therapy for antibiotics or any other reason? And the answer is, in the home, we don't generally do IV. Um, IV antibiotics, generally, and I can't speak for every situation or every hospice, but generally, IV antibiotics are considered somewhat aggressive and aren't recommended. Um, we have done them in our inpatient unit or in nursing facilities, and we have done IV fluids. But generally, those are both very difficult to do in the home and have to be monitored by an RN, which isn't generally something that's done. Thank you so much, everyone.